you're good to say hi. Yeah. Oh, good. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. And I was really excited to see um, among the list of so many names earlier, Lucy's Place, which is a Little Rock based LGBTQ uh, plus homeless center, um, which was founded, I think, in the 2000s. Um, and it was such a breath of fresh air in my home state of Arkansas to see such a thriving organization. So thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who invited me here. I'm just going to talk a little bit about my journey um, into conversion therapy and uh, out of it, I hope, <laughs> even though I continue to talk about it frequently. Um, I, when I was younger, I grew up in a very small town of about 100 people. Um, and in that town, really the only thing that was available for us as a community center was a church. It was a small Baptist church, and it was really a beautiful place full of um, really nice people, and I felt at home there uh, growing up. And I remember about until the age of, let's say, 14, um, it was just a really safe space for me. I loved reading the Bible. I loved reading about Jesus's compassion and really identified with so much of the language that was affirming and beautiful about humanity and our ability to forgive and to really understand each other's perspectives. Um, and that, that was what resonated for me. And even, you know, our sermons were filled with, um, you know, admonitions to go out and serve people and, and to really try to help people um, become the best versions of themselves. And um, so I grew up with that expectation, um, you know, th that I would go forward in that church and feel that love always. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, I remember sitting in our church one day in Sunday school, and a man came in, he was very breathless and angry, and um, as they always are, and he came in and he, he threw this petition down and he said, there's going to be one of those parades um, in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I need everyone here to sign a petition to make sure that that parade doesn't happen and to show that we're against it. And I remember sitting there, and I'm sure some of you have had similar experiences and thinking, you know, as the paper is going around the table um, and people are signing their names to it, thinking, you know, at this point I knew I was a gay man, but I had never said that to anyone. And of course, I had conflicted feelings about it um, being in a very small town in Arkansas. And there just weren't examples of gay men. Um, and I remember as the paper was being passed around thinking, if I sign this, um, I'm basically a huge hypocrite and a liar. And if I don't sign this, they're going to wonder what's up. And then I'm going to have to try to explain it and I'm going to become, you know, um, a sexual suspect. And so I signed it. And to this day, I still remember the feeling of signing that. It was really a disgusting feeling because I, I take great pride in, you know, what I stand behind and I always have. Um, but, you know, it was like the first real wake up call about what was about to happen to me. And um, a year later, um, my dad moved us to a place called um, Cherokee Village, Arkansas, which is a ridiculous name. Um, and he set up a Ford dealership there and brought us to a new church. And I found a girlfriend and I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it straight. I'm going to try to make it work so that I don't have to ever feel that again. And I don't have anyone asking questions about who I am. Well, um, once again, there was another moment in church that um, raised the tension considerably. And that was that um, when I was 16, my dad um, experienced a calling to be a preacher. And um, I was sitting in the pews with my mom and my dad started crying and shaking. And he came down the aisle and uh, the preacher at the time announced that my dad was now going to be a preacher. So, um, you know, we go up to the front of, of the church and everyone's like congratulating us and giving us hugs. And um, I guess my mom had started to kind of question things at that point. And we were, you know, cause we were kind of looking at each other like, what is this? This seems 
sudden and scary because of who we are. And I'll tell you more about my mom so you'll understand um, how much she doesn't always fit a preacher's wife. Um, or, I mean, the conception of a preacher's wife. She definitely is a great preacher's wife, and I think she's better because of her personality. But some people didn't always think so. So we were kind of these um, outcasts in a way. I was secretly an outcast. She was just, you know, my mom has this bright blonde hair. She looks kind of like Dolly Parton, and she's just really <laughs> fabulous. Um, and so it, it's hard for her to like, you know, not stand out in a church. Um, so fast forward, I break up with my girlfriend um, and someone outs me. Um, this is when I'm 18 and I, it's my first semester of college. So um, someone outs me and um, calls my parents and says out of a, a sense of, you know, vindictiveness that I um, am gay and I'm, I'm living an openly gay lifestyle, which was not true, whatever an openly gay lifestyle is. Um, and, um, and so my mom came up to pick me up at the, the school and brought me back to my dad. And my dad, who had never really talked about LGBTQ issues at all, um, he led me into his bedroom and he closed the door and he said, well, I talked to Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, and I always call them out every time I talk about this because what they did was terrible. Um, he said, I called Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis and they said that they have some brochures um, from a place called Love in Action, which is in Memphis also, and that they can cure you. And um, I said, well, <laughs> I don't know about that. That, you know, even at the time I'd never heard of such a thing. And none of my family had heard of such a thing. You know, they, they were just calling the people that they trusted um, in the hierarchy of the church. And um, my dad said, well, if you don't do this, uh, we will not speak to you again. Um, we won't help you with college anymore. I was on a scholarship, but I still had to take some of their money because I didn't have a full scholarship. And, um, and you'll never talk to your mom again. And, um, you know, my dad will now say that was the biggest mistake of his life, um, saying those words. And I agree, you know, I mean, I don't know, I don't know his whole life, but it was a pretty big mistake. And, um, and I know my mom just didn't say a word. Um, she went into the bathroom and vomited um, because she was so disturbed by the whole experience. And I remember that night, I was just like, looking up like how do I what is my what is a credit score you know how do I how do I save myself financially if this is going to happen and and what should I do and um and I ended up going that summer uh, the summer between my freshman and my sophomore year and no one at the school knew none of my new friends that I'd been hanging out with knew um none of my professors had any idea what was going on and I was just living this like totally secret life hoping that, you know, either this would cure me or that I would somehow be seen as good again in my parents' eyes just for having gone to love in action. And um, fast forward to that summer, um, I won't go through all the therapy <laughs> techniques because I do think they are really triggering and they're really upsetting, but I will tell you um, just in generally what they did, um, which was, um, you know, I can't speak for all of conversion therapy, but I've studied it quite a bit in the time that I wrote my book and did a lot of advocacy. And the thing that they all have in common um, is that they they do attempt to change um, sexual orientation, gender expression, often in the same uh, basket. You know, they kind of they had no idea the, about the difference between sexuality and gender. Um, they tend to use outdated theories. Um, Freudian theories often as an attempt to um, really throw anything at the wall and see what sticks because um, what I will say about conversion therapy is that it's built on a lie, right? The lie is bigotry. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's the idea that um, someone is lesser than another just because of who they are. And it turns out when you try to build an entire philosophy <laughs> based on a a lie at its center, it doesn't work. Um, 
So, you know, this was classic brainwashing. Um, it was stripping people down, making them feel worthless, exploiting their, this was a Christian um, based conversion therapy camp. So it was exploiting people's relationship with God in order to um, really just like use God as a battering ram against somebody's soul. Um, I once had a, a famous novelist, Charles Baxter, tell me that he would describe my experience in conversion therapy as soul murder. And I agree with him on that. I think they didn't accomplish it, <laughs> um, but they certainly tried. And so the one technique I will tell you about that they did, because it's relevant to the story of compassion and, and how I came back to it. Um, I was sitting, you know, it was like the second week at Love in Action and they had this thing called a lie chair. And there was this huge auditorium full of people, um, everyone from the program. And I was told to sit across from an empty chair and imagine my father is inside of it. Now, some of you may know that this is already a pretty normal um, tactic that people use in regular therapy sessions. But, you know, love in action would take something that was already being used and, and really pervert it to use a, a word that has been used against queer people in the past. Um, and, um, and so they asked me to sit across from an empty chair and imagine my father and then yell at him and tell him how much I hated him. Now, earlier I told you all this is based on bigotry, which is a lie, right? So their idea was that every gay man must have father, father issues and must secretly hate his father. Well, that's as old as Freud, and it's not true. <laughs> um, and, you know, and so I said to the empty chair, um, I'm not actually mad at you. I'm upset that we're having this disagreement, and I'm upset that this thing has come between our relationship. And that was not good enough for the counselors. And so um, they said, well, you, you've been hiding your real feelings this whole time, and you're not trying to do these activities. And I said, I don't hate my father. That is just patently untrue. It's not true. Um, and I stood up and they said, well, you need to let this out, let this emotion out. And luckily by this time I had, you know, read outside of the Bible and, um, you know, and inside the Bible quite enough to know that this was not at all <laughs> normal. Um, you know, take, take 1984 by, by Orwell and you can see that people are trying to make you think certain thoughts um, and, you know, thank God for the teachers who taught me that kind of literature. And, um, and then I started thinking to myself, you know, they kept using the word hate, like, I hate my father, and they were trying to get me to hate my father. And I just said, like, I don't hate my father. And it's actually like, not Christian of you to, instead of use compassion, like use hatred as a tool. And I said, I think there's only, you know, I was thinking to myself, like, there's only one place where that comes from. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and so I stormed out and I, they usually take all of your belongings when you come into the camp. And so I stormed out and got my phone and I said, this is an emergency. I need help right now. Um, and they weren't going to give it to me at first, but I just kept, kept saying it's an emergency. It's an emergency. Um, and so I, I went off into the bathroom with my cell phone, called my mom and said, I need you to pick me up. And, um, you know, luckily she did. And she came to outside the camp. And uh, the counselors came over and they said, oh, he needs to stay here so much longer, like three months, maybe two years, you need to get him out of college. He's a really bad case. He's extremely gay, <laughs> um, which is true. Um, and, you know, my mom was like, you know, she heard these words and she just kept thinking this seems like some sort of cult, you know, and she said, I don't know why I've never asked this before, but what are your qualifications? And John Smith, who ran the camp, who is now an openly gay man with his husband um, and speaks out against conversion therapy, which is a whole other story. But he said at that time, well, um, I've gone or I've, I've worked with Alcoholics Anonymous and um, I've been a marriage counselor. <laughs> and my mom was like, what is a marriage counselor doing telling my son how to ungay himself? Um, and, you know, it just like suddenly snapped for her that this was this was a form of um, danger. And, um, and so she took me home and my dad showed up at the door and he said, did it work? And I said, no, <laughs> didn't work. Like we're back a day early. And um, we swept it under the rug for probably 10 years. Um, I went 
to Peace Corps in Ukraine, I did a lot of other things. I was just trying to find myself in a world that didn't seem trustworthy anymore. You know, I think anyone here who has had the experience of of having religion used against them um, understands how painful that is and how harmful it is for both the people in the religion and the people who are now kicked out of it. Um, and it took really going back and asking questions of my, my parents when I was writing Boy Erased um, and hearing their story and hearing that you know, my mom had married at the age of 16 and she'd always listened to what these men had to say in her church and had never really questioned it. She'd put her whole faith, her trust in those men. And when they failed her, she felt that kind of betrayal like I did. Um, and it took talking to my dad and seeing how he was softening on his earlier ideas about the church and how things were more complicated for him the older he got and um, and hearing his apology to me um, to come back to that original idea of compassion that I had loved so much from the church and um, and I guess like you know my my thing that I would say um, since I, I'm short on time I believe uh, is that those lessons that I learned early on um, about love those were I think I, I don't think I could have survived any of this without those lessons, or um, I don't think my parents could have survived it. And I don't necessarily consider myself Christian anymore, um, but I do know that the same things that loved me then um, allowed me to really love myself again and my family. And I'm so grateful, you know, and I, I don't know what higher power there is. I'm not sure that there is one, I don't know, but I feel that love, a very deep and abiding love. Um, and I, I think like, it's so tough because many of our stories from conversion therapy don't end up this way. And many parents don't apologize and, and continue to be toxic. And sometimes you just have to walk away. Um, but that love, I hope, I hope that if we, you know, in our community can show people that love and do things like you're doing here tonight um, that we can sort of pave a different kind of family for people. Um, and so, yeah, it's a simple message, but it's an incredibly important one. And it's one that I think not to use the trope of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger because sometimes it just kills you. <laughs> um, but I think if I had not gone through some of these things that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have discovered the purity of love, just how beautiful it actually is and how simple it actually is. Um, and I'm eternally grateful for that. So yeah, that's my, that's my little speech, but I wanted to leave time for, I, I don't know if we're doing questions right now or not. Great. Thanks so much or, for or taking some time to share your lived experience and share your story. Um, not only with the attendees tonight, but also those of us on the panel um, who might be hearing it for the first time as well. Um, I think we have time for one question. Um, before I read that question, I do want to send a message to our attendees. Feel free to utilize the question and answer function here on Zoom to ask questions of our panelists um, as they uh, share their experiences with you, their areas of expertise. If you have questions, please feel free to engage by utilizing that question and answer function. So Garrett, really quickly, um, if you could, um, can you talk a little bit about um, if there was maybe one realization that you found out about yourself after attending um, conversion therapy? Yeah, um, <laughs> there's so many realizations. <laughs> it's like a book full. <laughs> but, um, but I think that yeah, I think I was surprised to find looking back on my experience that there were moments of beauty and um, nuance in an experience that was truly harrowing. Um, you know, <laughs> to go back into the John Smith um, who ran the camp detail, uh, he messaged me years later after he read a piece I wrote about my experience at Love and Action and he said, um, I'm so sorry for 
everything I've done. And, you know, it was hard to read, but I thought, you know, it took a lot of guts for him to contact me. And, um, and then he said something that was really funny that just made me kind of laugh about the experience, which was, he was like, I loved everything you said. And I thought it was so true, except was the place really that tacky looking? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it was John. Like you didn't have good taste and I'm sorry to tell it to you. Um, but you know, he had like a lot of embroidered Bible verses and like, you know, it, you know, not to shame anyone who loves embroidered Bible verses, but it was just very sparse white with like kind of ugly decor. And he was so upset by that. And then we kind of like bonded in a strange way. Um, so yeah, I thought that was really funny. And then um, I guess just like the journey since then has been so surprising to me. Um, I, I didn't know when I first started writing Boy Race in 2012, um, we didn't have the Williams Institute numbers about how many people had gone through conversion therapy. Um, so we didn't yet know that there were, you know, almost 600,000 in the US alone, um, which is such a, a crazy thing to not know, you know, and, um, and then later, when I uh, started publishing other pieces, and I published the book, I got so many emails from people, and it was just really startling because I'd felt so alone. Um, my experience felt like this isolated incident that just happened to me. And I was just so grateful whenever I saw people reaching out to me and sharing their experiences, which were sometimes hard to um, listen to, but also incredibly affirming. Um, and, and I just, it made me believe in the power of story. Thanks so much um, for going down memory lane for me and picking one realization to share um, with the attendees here tonight. Um, and again, thanks for opening up about your lived experience and sharing that. Um, We're now going to transition over to our second moderator, Drew, and he's going to talk with Reverend Brandon Johnson. 